Being able to uniquely identify the application or software that is vulnerable is crucial. This will help us understand that we are using the vulnerable software and that we need to consider patching or in another way remediate the vulnerability. Here, in part 6, we will discuss two common ways of identifying software or applications. We start with the CPE. This is short for Common Platform Enumeration. It is a standardized naming format for identifying a specific piece of software, package or operating system but it is also applied to hardware components. The CPE is what NVD uses to describe the software that is affected by a vulnerability. Similar to the CVE identifier for a vulnerability, the CPE identifier can be used to uniquely identify a specific software or hardware in a highly granular way. The CPE specification is hosted and maintained by NIST, just like NVD. The string consists of 13 parts though only a few of them are used in the normal case. The first part just identifies the string as a CPE and the second part the CPE version that the string is based on. The next part is the type of product. This can be either an A for applications, H for hardware or O for operating systems. Then the manufacturer of the product is identified followed by the name of the product. The next part is the product version and this is followed by the update field, which can be used if a version has a service pack or to identify a minor version. Then the granularity increases for each new part, and it is possible to, for example, specify specific language versions of a product or which hardware target that the build is made for. As a few examples, here is a CPE for a version of the Chrome web browser. It is an application the vendor is Google, the product is Chrome, and the version is 9.0.597.7. The asterisk used to the final seven parts is a wildcard character, so it should match all variants with this version number. The second example is similar, but here the vendor is Apache and the product is Log4j, which is a well-known library. The CPE specifies here the version 2.0 and the update, which is beta 9. The third example identifies a very specific version of Windows. The vendor is Microsoft and the product is Windows 7. Since the version is included in the product name, it does not have a specific version, but the update is given by SP1, which is Service Pack 1. Then there are no specific values for edition and language, but the software edition is given as Enterprise. So it is Windows 7 Enterprise with Service Pack 1. Finally, the target hardware is x64, so it identifies the specific Windows 7 version, but only for 64-bit processors. The CPE identifier has been used for many years. More recently, another format for uniquely identifying software has emerged. This is the package URL, or PURL. It is designed to refer to a software package that is located in a public repository. It is thus very suitable for open source software since this will often be published through, for example, the Python package index, Maven, NPM, NuGet, or some other place depending on the programming language used. It can also identify packages on, for example, GitHub, Bitbucket, or Docker images on Docker Hub, or packages that do not have a default repository, such as .dev, .rpm, or .apk packages that are used in different Linux distributions and Android. The PURL is a valid URL according to the specification. The format is given by seven different components. The scheme always has the constant value PKG. The package type points to the repository or the package manager for the packet, such as Maven, NPM, APK or Docker. Since package names are unique within these repositories or managers, this is a required field in order to uniquely point to a package. The namespace will depend on the type. For example, for Maven it is the group ID, and for Linux packages the vendor such as Ubuntu, Fedora or Alpine. The fourth component is the name of the package, which is also a required field. The fixed scheme together with the type and the name are the only required components in the PURL. 
The next component is the version number for the package. This is prefixed with the at character. Then follows the qualifiers preceded by a question mark. This can be used to provide more specific information about the package. It could, for example, specify the target architecture, operating system, or a distribution. Following the URL specification, there can be several qualifiers if you want to specify more pieces of information here. These are then separated by an ampersand, just as we are used to in the URL's queries. The last part of the PURL is the subpath, which can be used if you want to refer to a specific path within a package. Similar to CPE, the package URL is created as a hierarchy, being more specific the further to the right in the string we go. And being a URL, the PURL also takes advantage of other things that we are used to in URLs, for example UTF-8 and present encoding of non-ASCII characters. Even though the package URL is a valid URL, it does not point to exactly where the packet can be found. Instead, each type, or at least most of them, has a default repository location. If the type is NPM, then the default location is the location of the NPM registry. In the registry, you will be able to find more information on the package, including the location of the repository. Similar default repositories exist for, for example, Maven, NuGet, and the Python package index. The default repositories are provided by the package URL specification, but are not part of the package URL itself, since the idea is to just to identify the packet uniquely, not primarily to give information about its exact location. But as you can see, this information is sometimes implicitly there as well. For some types, the package repository can be implied by the namespace component or one of the qualifiers. Here are a few examples of what a package URL can look like. In the first example, the type is given by the Python package index, which is the repository that hosts the software package. Then the name of the package is given by Django. Since type and name are required fields, we know that there is no namespace defined of this package. Then the version is given by 1.11.1, and there is no further information that narrows down to different variants of the package. In the second example, the type is deb, which is a Debian package file. Since deb is used by several different Linux distributions, the namespace is used to point to the package for the Debian distribution. Then the name is given by curl and the version is specified as 7.50.3-1. There are also two qualifiers, one identifying that it is the package for the i386 architecture and one that points to the Jesse distro, which in this case is a name given to a specific Debian release. The last example shows a package hosted and managed by Maven. The group ID is given by org.apache.xml graphics and the name of the package is batic-anim. The name is referred to as artifact ID in Maven. The group ID together with the artifact ID will uniquely identify a package. The version is given by 1.9.1 and the qualifier packaging is used to point to the packaging type that was produced and that we wish to specifically identify here. In this case, it is the sources that the package URL points to. Being able to deterministically identify a piece of software and its version is crucial for mapping vulnerabilities to specific applications and systems. The CPE and PURL schemes are two ways of doing this. The CPE is more universal, while the PURL is more suitable for open source software. To better understand, mitigate and avoid vulnerabilities, it is useful to look at the underlying weakness. The CWE scheme is a way of categorizing weaknesses that in turn can lead to security vulnerabilities. In the next part, we will look at how CWE is used to categorize the underlying weaknesses, giving us a catalog of problems that should be avoided when designing, configuring, and implementing secure systems and applications.